grace, mercy, and peace. From God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. In my work, I get to read a lot, but most of the reading I do is not pleasure reading. Most of it is Greek and Hebrew and biblical scholars all this time. So what I have done is when I take a trip and you've got that five hours from here to L.A., I pick up kind of worthless, trashy novels, and I just read them for fun, and, actually, and I usually end up reading murder mysteries. And I did it again this time, and when I began to read, there are two ways of telling a mystery. The first one is the most common, and it's kind of like they hold out that secret piece of information, who done it, until the very end, and they keep you in suspense. And then as this new information comes in and the pieces fall together, finally at the end, kind of like the old board game clue, you can say, aha, the butler did it with the candlestick in the library. And it all comes together. But the other way is to begin to tell the reader the secret at the beginning, right up front. And then as you have this piece of secret, mysterious information, then you begin to watch as all the other characters begin to unravel and try to solve the mystery as they go about living their lives. And I know I'm dating myself, but it's kind of like that old password TV commercial. And he would say, and now we will show our studio audience. And they would give you the word, and you knew the answer. And then you would watch as the contestants would go through their mazes. This is the liturgical year of Mark. And as Mark is trying to tell us the mystery of who this Jesus is and the secret of what difference this Jesus makes, he tells it in the second style, not the first. And right out front, he tells us the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Boom! There is no doubt. This is the secret. And now he knew the secret. And now he lets you, the reader, in on this secret. And the first story he tells this baptism of Jesus. And I skipped that first part because we did. We talked about John a lot. But one of the wonderful things about Mark, he is so economical with his words. You only have three verses. And yet in those simple three verses, he tells you so much. He tells you first, after he doesn't even tell you about the baptism. After the baptism, he comes up out of the water. He saw the heavens open up, literally torn apart. And it takes you back to the 64th chapter of Isaiah. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And we heard that during Advent. And then he saw the Spirit descending like a dove. And it takes you back to Isaiah. And I will pour my Spirit upon your descendants and your seed and your grandchildren forever. And then you hear that voice from heaven say, You are my beloved son. And it is the enthronement all when a new king would come to Israel. But not like the old kings of the past. You are the one in whom I'm well pleased. My beloved. This is the Messiah. And in these three simple verses, Mark begins to tell you all four prophecies are now fulfilled. This Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy. But it's interesting. As he does this, not everyone knows it. And when you look at that word, he, it's singular. Jesus comes out. He sees the heavens door open. He sees the Spirit, not the people around him. Only he is given this mysterious secret, and he begins to realize who and what he is. The others don't. The authorities think he's a troublemaker. The people wonder if he is Elijah or a prophet. And the disciples remain confused, and even John the Baptist is going to go and say, Are you really the one? It sure doesn't look like it to me. <laughs> Jesus knows. And now we, the readers, begin to know. And it is the presence of the light and the love of God and the words of forgiveness that begin to enter. And then we watch as that reality, that mystery enters our world, enters into the people's lives, begins to reshape and brings hope and strength and life where there was only despair and hurt and death. But here's the good news for us today. This is not just a story about Jesus' baptism back there. It is a story about baptism. It is our baptismal story. And in the waters of baptism, we are told this mysterious secret. And we're told it up front at the beginning of our lives, not at the end. And we are told, we are claimed, that word is spoken, it has called us. We are the children of God. And it's interesting, most people don't see us that way. And they don't really have a great reason to see us that way. From the outside, it looks like we're just struggling people trying to do the best we can like everybody else in the world, and it's true. 
From the outside, it looks like we are people that say one thing on a Sunday morning and do something else on a Monday morning, and it's true. And to the rest of the world, it looks like we are just as confused and mixed up as anybody else, and it is true. And all that truth, we know a deeper truth. We know what God has done and what God is continuing to do. And that word continues to be spoken. And it is a word of light and love. And then we watch as it continues to reshape and redirect and promises us our this future, not only in our lives, but in our church and in our world. After my father's funeral, we sat around the kitchen table. As we sat around the kitchen table with mom, there was, you know, you, you just have so many decisions you've got to make. And what were we going to do with mom? And what should that immediate future be? And of course, none of us really knew, so we just started sharing ideas. But here was the interesting thing. Every time any one of us would say dad's name, the kitchen light would flicker. And we would talk a little more, and then someone would mention dad's name, and the kitchen light would and then someone else would mention Dad's name and the kitchen light wouldn't flicker and we'd wait and it would flicker later as a year slow. <laughs> and after this went on for a while, we started going, <sighs> My brother-in-law was never on the kitchen table because he was not law. <laughs> but he's also an engineer. And he came in and he said, you know, I noticed every time the air conditioning compressor comes on, it creates a vibration that makes the lights flicker. You might have a loose connection somewhere. <laughs> now, were we supposed to call Ghostbusters for some paranormal activity, or should I call an electrician? It really doesn't matter. Because as something as common as a light flickering, we were reminded of a deeper truth. My father's presence entered that room. My father was still there. And my father was with us in the hurt and the pain and the confusion and the uncertainty of what that future would be. And we knew that mysterious secret was there with us. And it was going to shape our grief and our laughter and our lives. Today, in common, very ordinary things bred, and wine and water through ordinary people like you and me. God is going to tear open the heavens and his word and his spirit descends and it descends on you this day and it says you are my own. And that is the mystery we know as we begin this new year. And in that promise and in that hope, that word continues to reshape, reclaim and mold us. And in that, we rejoice. And we put our trust, and we put our love. Amen.